Um, hi, I'm India, and this research was conducted on behalf of the, or as part of the Cornell Summer Research Institute, um, and it was done by me, Aaron Lane, and Professor Katie Sagel. Um, so, we researched Elmira Hart Lincoln Phelps, who was an educator and author working most markedly in the field of botany in the 19th century. Among other notable accomplishments, she published the textbook Familiar Lectures on Botany in 1829, which grew rapidly in significance, both within the classroom as an innovative template for curriculum and across the country in non-traditional spaces of learning, especially with women whose lives were centered around the domestic sphere. Um, this project was an attempt to shed light on one of the many influential female scientists who have been lost in the wash of history. Much of my research, therefore, centered around uh, the history of botany itself, and more specifically the gaps in the narrative, which were most likely left by those who did not have access to a formal education and whose voices were overpowered by those with the means. Um, endeavoring to fill these gaps, I explored the strategies women employed to secure an education and force their way into conversations from which they had been intentionally excluded. In the 19th century, when Phelps worked, um, women were expected to obtain a proficiency in many scientific topics, especially botany, whose subject matter related to domestic chores um, without achievement of expert level knowledge or expectation of a position in the professional sphere. Thus, Phelps's circumstances, that of balancing the contradicting nature of holding significance and even fame within a field where she was never meant to display mastery, was seen as a direct threat to those in power, and she was not alone. Um, in addition to tireless research, countless female scientists of the 19th century were forced to consider um, their positions and context to the male ego and take appropriate action. I found instances of female authors apologizing for the publication of their work within that same work, um, citing God and the spread of Christianity as the sole motive for their educational um, pursuits and crediting their research to male colleagues. Moreover, I looked for evidence of these strategies within Phelps's own work. By studying different editions of the same textbook, I was able to track the rising influence of familiar lectures on botany and draw conclusions regarding Phelps's own methods for existing as a woman within a male-dominated space. From its earliest publication, Familiar Lectures includes in its introduction a description of botany as a means to foster greater love and reverence for God, a sentiment which would excuse its female authorship. Furthermore, in the later editions of Familiar Lectures, as the text grew in popularity and Phelps' understanding of botany um, deepened considerably, she shifted from rudimentary descriptions to more complex explanations to remedy a display of such expertise and maintain her success without question or ridicule. Phelps altered the text to include a letter of endorsement from her respected male mentor. Um, and then finally, I explored the modern influence of this historic scientific culture soaked in white male privilege Regardless of the undeniable evolution and growth of the fem feminine sphere of influence, I was left with more doubts and questions than I was with certainty. The nature of progress, who decides the when and where and how, is always worth examining. Despite the appearance of a recent surge of women working in scientific fields, most of the highest paying respected careers, physicians, surgeons, dentists, etc., are still held overwhelmingly by men. Certainly women holding any place in a scientific field is worthy of celebration, um, but the structure of modern science seems to mirror almost alarmingly the 19th century culture in which Phelps worked, where women were expected to obtain a proficiency in scientific knowledge without ever gaining expertise or breaching the professional sphere. The scope and meanings of these words, proficiency versus expertise, might have widened and transformed, but such changes beg the question, to what extent are these alterations organic um, or how might they be another weapon of those in power? And then Aaron's going to speak. <laughs> Thank you. So um, my name's Aaron Lane, and I'm the Digital Liberal Arts Coordinator at Cornell College. And Indy did a fantastic job. She's an undergraduate student. So, um, so my job was to um, help Dr. Sagel and Indy come up with a website to highlight Phelps's work. Um, we sought to create a website that would be somewhat simple to create, edit, and contribute to. Um, the website was a culmination of their research, but since she had less time to dedicate to creating the website than the research, we wanted to find a tech solution that wouldn't require copious amounts of time to learn. Um, in addition, our institutionally, our IT department has ongoing concerns about the um, 
quality and security of websites created through and affiliated with a college. Previous faculty and students have created websites using WordPress, and some of them have actually been hacked, so there are some concerns with that. Um, so we um, eventually decided to go with Google Sites. Um, it has some affordances that we thought would be important, such as varied navigation choices, ways to incorporate media, make aesthetic choices. It's limited, but it was ample enough for what we were trying to do. So when teaching India um, how to create the website, I focused on um, these elements um, on the screen. For navigation, she learned how to set up the menu and organize pages and subpages. Um, what aesthetic choices she could make. And you can tell if you take a look at her site, it's very consistent. She made really great choices on making the font consistent and the color scheme and things like that. Um, and she also learned to use the color picker and hex codes to choose colors and how to use HTML tags for customization. In working with HTML, she learned specifically how to add pop-up or mouse over text to economize space um, for citations and to manually modify text font, font size, and other font characteristics, which you, she chose not to do because it really wasn't necessary, but she learned some things along the way with that. Um, we started with practicing um, on a sandbox site, which this is a picture of it, and we played with navigation, the pages icon, the banner image, fonts, and then played around with different op options for font choice, font size, font color. You can see the different things there, all using HTML. Um, you can see in the box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen um, that that's where in Google Sites you would add the HTML. Um, on the next screen, you can see where she added the pop-up text, and she did that using the code that was um, listed down below, and that was just to economize space and, and save a little bit of time there. And so some future work that could be done on this, obviously, it's you're just starting, so more research of um, Phelps's writing. Obviously, something that would be really interesting would be to digitize the text to be able to do computational text analysis, um, GIS work, and then expanding. She does have a timeline as well, which I think gives some contextualizes it well. So here are emails if you have any questions um, further, and if you'd like to take a look at the site, there's a QR code there to check it out. So thank you for your attention and time.